Big O. It mixes Phil Noir elements with giant mechas, and it's Batman. also... Yeah, it's Mecha Batman, pretty much. The premise of the series was very interesting in the way that everyone had amnesia, and they didn't really know what was going on. What if we had to reorganize, restructure the world? The greater significance behind the giant robots, the Mega Deuces, that occupy this new paradigm city. So there's a lot of symbolism with Big O, but it's not really contributing to the enjoyment factor. You're just enjoying the flavor. I think the second season lowered the quality a lot, and I know the only reason why it even got a second season was because the American viewers that were watching it in the first season is where it's at and in the second season they don't really make as much of an effort. Big O is never really too pretentious. It just is extremely vague and ambiguous, which makes it have a, a very unsatisfying conclusion. But the overall trip is fun, a very good fun classic enjoyment. Wolf's Reign had a lot of potential in the way they set up the philosophical themes, but near the end where they try to kind of explain the concept of paradise and what exactly it means, they just don't do, do a really great job. I don't know, there's just something really... Bones? <laughs> Bones, yeah. I guess you could play in Bones. This is basically the main problem. Wolf's Reign as like an epic style melodrama, but on the bad side of it, it's kind of like a one trick pony or one trick wolf. It has a singular emotional style that it keeps going for, and if you're not part of that misery train that it loves to stay on, then you're gonna get really bored with it fast. It's a very murky kind of show. You're just watching this for the feels. The ending had a nice kind of cute fantasy concept, but it's not like the show is based on foreshadowing or anything. It's definitely a unique ride. You get some of the better music from Yoko Kano's career, but it's just way too sad, too much dead time, and the infamous four episode recap episodes. Has very unique style to it. Thought the series had a lot more potential, but yeah, Bones. it did not live up to it because of Bones. It tried to be really good, but failed. The characters, they had their own personalities, they had their own conflicts and dilemmas, but the story just felt sort of unfocused. There was just all sorts of things put together, but there was no something that puts all the themes together. Okay, we'll go to February. I have to ask you, have you seen Gun Parade March? Have you heard of Total Eclipse? Yeah, yeah it, it was a piece of shit. Imagine the same thing, but instead of an excuse for harem, this is an excuse for school life. Alien invasion, the world is about to be destroyed, and then say, oh, does he like me? Do I look fat in this dress? That's the show. <laughs> yeah, that's the fucking show! Yeah, 2,000 people got killed in the next country. So, the promise tonight! <laughs> Okay, now go to April. Airmaster from the same director that did Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, you can totally tell he has his hand in this show because this has some of the best fight scenes ever. Just for it being a typical budgeted kind of show, the animation is pretty good considering the dynamic camera angles, and the main heroine is mostly just an 80s muscly Schwarzenegger chick. She doesn't really have a personality, but you're not watching this for any kind of deep reason. This is just a good bust em up action show. Is, you know, it complete. But if you've been enamored with the show up until the ending, the whole show is just one kick-ass of an epic. There are a lot of annoying characters here. The side stories are very meandering, but no, just enjoy the fun, cool, beautifully designed fights. Kick-ass. Kino's Journey is a very interesting series. I know Drawry probably doesn't like it that much because it's episodic. It uses that to its strength a lot in this. So pretty much it's about Kino going to these different countries on different political views and like philosophical workings and they're very different from each other and I think each episode has this sort of message to it and it was just very interesting to see. There was always a central message that they were trying to show, really atmospheric, has nice concepts and settings. It's an anime philosophical fable. Well, let's just say this. I watched this show after Mushishi, and this show did absolutely nothing for me afterwards. The concept still is pretty good. I guess the show is trying to show us the best and worst of humanity in a society setting, but we more so see bad side of humanity than anything good. Just two, one note. And Kino is not the best main character in the world, and I still don't know why people like the show so much. As a standalone show, it's just too uneventful, and you see one episode, and another episode will fit the same tone. With Mushishi, you always knew that there was going to be some some kind of mysticism, but you never knew where it could come from because the mysticism seemed to be universal. Here, it's just like, oh yeah, humans do fucked up things. Big deal. Yeah, we might as well rewatch Elfin Lead if you want more of that. I don't recommend it. I recommend Mushishi or Galaxy Express 3.9. The reasons of why you don't like it are very valid, but you forgot the most important one of them all. It's episodic, so it cannot be good. Dean Angel, 
I was interested in this because I like the idea of artistic manipulation and spirituality. I mean, the entire show is bullshit. It's about a guy being possessed by immortalized spirits that just possess new art. It doesn't make any sense. The ending is totally original. The romance is very forced and melodramatic. The main character is very annoying. Any experienced anime fan knows that this show is bad. It was a good gateway anime, I suppose. It has enough action for a non shoujo person could think that shoujo could be alright, but it's a very painful kind of average. Mediocre, that's the word for it. I remember how it was hyped too much back when it was airing, and it was even recommended as an alternative to Naruto. <laughs> it's like, what exactly you see the Naruto issues over here? And what I failed to notice is that it was mostly liked by women because, well, it's a shoujo, yet it was presented like a shonen action just because it had that shonen bits. But yeah, you were mostly interested in the silly romance going on in there than the actual fighting scenes, and the whole plot is quite contrived and to the most part episodic. I sort of lost interest when the story was mostly about the main character having a split personality and his one personality is in love with one girl and his other personality is in love with her twin sister. Oh my god, mind blown. Shoujo bullshit. Last Exile is by Gonzo, of course, uh -oh. and it's actually one of the only decent series that they've done. Until the and, sequel you know, they managed to completely fuck it up in Silver Fan, but, you know, this season was actually pretty good. The characters were still somewhat relatable. They didn't fall into the typical anime trope character archetypes. You know, the story was pretty decent. Like, the steampunk element added a lot to it. Very light world building. If you try to think too seriously about Last Exile and, and just don't see it as, like, an action show, then you will hate it. That's what happened with me. The setting seems so interesting. They the airships looked so funky, there was a war going on, mysteries and rebellions, pod races, other Star Wars and shit, and I just didn't care, because everything seemed like random ideas that they were just making on the spot. The ending, you know, typical Gonzo, just seems to just happen, it is no classic, and it certainly did not deserve a bullshit sequel. Kaleido Star! Supposed to be the second best Gonzo show, right Rory? I mean, second only to NHK? Yes it is. Unlike most other bullshit that this studio has done, this is actually a very good family-oriented series. There is no grand-scaled plot, it's just about some girl trying to be a good circus performer. But I really like how she tries to make friends and become better at her favorite occupation. And yes, down to it, it's just a silly motivational show. But it's so based on characterization, it feels so down to earth. There are only a few bits of fan service. To the most part, it's just getting to know the characters, how they feel. The plot doesn't mean much after a while, and it does boil down to trying hard to achieve your dreams. But it's so well made! This is one of the best family-oriented series I I've ever seen. This is what you can easily show to your parents and your little sister, unless they're annoyed by those little fun service scenes, because, you know, there's this pervert spirit in there, and it's like, why is that spirit there? It's just kind of, ah, uh, the whole thing. But other than that, I recommend the show. It's very good for what it's supposed to be. Why couldn't you make more shows like that, Gonzo? Stelvia is an unfortunate little child. This almost could have been one of my favorite kids anime. As a coming of age, you have this one girl character who starts to nurture her talents and then grow an affinity toward her actions. The show, unfortunately, is split between a very good, very steadily developed coming of age sci-fi story for its first 12 episodes, and then its last half makes no fucking sense. You have two disasters that are built on aliens and a cosmic wave, when the first half never really was establishing that, you know? The mecha and CGI is is very very badly gonzo. The ending isn't really that satisfying for most of these characters and there's an excess of characters in the long run. The director that did this show did bodacious space pirates and you can clearly tell that. I don't know what's wrong with this guy. He directs up to a certain point and then it's like he gives up on the show or something. Just puts it into cliche, bubbly, gimmicky, quirky mode or something. And that's what happened with Stelvia. Scrap Princess. It's one of the earlier Bone series. I think what was interesting about this series is that they had the fantasy setting, but at the same time they managed to keep it somewhat realistic, somehow grounded. One of the most disappointing anime if I've ever seen. The first half of the show, much like Stelvia, was not bad. You have the concept of trying to survive, and that's the best part of the show right there. Now when it tries to get a plot, and the twist is that, oh, it's really sci-fi based, it just doesn't work. It enables any kind of deus ex machina magic to interrupt and have them be plot armored. And you always feel like there'll be some kind of danger, but unfortunately melodrama and tragic shock factor violence is the most tense we get here. It wasn't a bad show, but you know, Bones. It's becoming the perfect explanation for Bones anime. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I need to think of something to say about the anime by Bones, I just say that it's Bones. And it's sort of self-explanatory. 
Ooh, Sonic X. If you're a fan server show, you get some actually fun violence here. It's kind of neat to see how well they were able to adapt a lot of the um, video game kind of attack styles. And everything is pretty smoothly orchestrated into arcs. Little side stories for the main human character to grow and for its human audience to attach themselves to. I mean, unfortunately, the one weakness about Sonic X is that it feels it needs to have a human character in order for us to like the show more. It could have just been about Sonic saving the world and probably been a ten times better show, but even for right now, and it being neutered into being just this pissy kid show, it's still alright. Of course, if you're not a Sonic the Hedgehog fan, then this will do absolutely nothing. By no means will this convert you into being a Sonic fan. And it feels like it's ending on a cliffhanger. I don't know, I enjoyed it, for very, very biased reasons. Ninja Scroll TV adaptation of the Ninja Scroll movie. You know, we just tried to give a lot of more development to the characters, but the animation isn't as good because they switched to digital and doesn't look as nice. Like, I didn't end up caring about any of the characters that much. I just wanted to see some cool action scenes, and I just thought this worked a lot better in movie format than it did in TV format. Dixonalize, one of a kind anime. It does have a lot of interesting and cyberpunk elements, and it's also probably the most depressing anime that I've seen. It's really bleak and slow, but the bleakness was the sort of the central theme. It sucks you in with its atmosphere, especially in the first part of the show, wondering what is gonna be, what the theme is gonna be, and after that, just sort of everything goes to hell. It gets even more depressing and hopeless. I really enjoy the slow pace. The directing was really well done. The the way that they show proper angles and focus the characters. They weren't too deep, but they were still well-founded. You need to focus on his facial expressions. Technalize is basically about how our constant craving for our selfish desires just for ourselves will keep perpetuating more and more distance to our own humanity. How slow you notice characters get more and more selfish. It's a good mental representation of how people who constantly rid themselves of their cravings, of their lusts, of their desires. So Technalize is one of the better science fiction anime, but at a huge cost of being very unlikable and at the cost of you actually hating how right it may be. And yes, that means that the ending while very conclusive and satisfying for this kind of show, isn't the most, well, happy. <laughs> Moving to May. Interstellar 5555, the story of the secret star system. Is the only music video anime that I can think of. It's a good film. It uses the entire soundtrack of Daft Punk to fulfill a story. It's not necessarily a deep story, but it's a very spectacular musical all the same. Leiji Matsumoto's character designs give the feeling kind of like a universal sensation. Good pace, good animation, definitely sticks with you. And, you know, hey, it's Daft Punk. They kind of rock. You know, at first I liked it because it was Leiji nostalgia, but then I watched the remake of Yamato, so I say fuck it. <laughs> I don't care about it anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, I like Daft Punk as a band, so I enjoy this a lot. And I agree that Discovery is a lot better than Random Access Memories. Grammy proves it. <laughs> the Grammys. Basically, what gets a Grammy, <laughs> you don't need to like it. Parasite Dolls. This is an OVA spin-off of Bubblegum Crisis series, which is a spin-off of the AD Police series when... Pretty much it just takes a more serious look at the cyberpunk world and stuff. So if you're into cyberpunk and if you're into like this more serious and mature stories, say it's worth the watch. It's only three episode OVA. I think they maybe wanted to do more because it did feel like they were trying to develop the characters into something more, but you know, they only have limited time. So this is what happened. Kitsuji no, no Uta, weird incest romance vampire thing, and you know, I wasn't really sure what to think of it at first, you know, it's kind of depressing, it has like these muted colors and everything about it is just very somber, I guess, it's not very hyper over the top and colorful like anime see today, I'm not really sure what they were trying to do with it, I guess there's no real message, there wasn't really like, much else to it. June. So the Animatrix. This is a bunch of short anime OVAs that were related to The Matrix. And, you know, some of them were pretty good. Like, I remember the one that explained the history of how the robots took over and stuff. Some of them were pretty awful, like the full CGI one. Well, it's pretty dated. It's just a mixed bag of interesting shorts. So, you know, it's not a bad watch, I guess. Especially if you're, like, a big fan of The Matrix. It does provide good little backstories, varied amounts of animation styles, but it's not necessary to understand the Matrix more, it's just good fan service. Shadow Star Narutaru Shock Factor! This is an incomplete adaptation, which... So go read the manga. So go read the manga. That's pretty much what it says at the end. It starts off very innocent and you don't, like, one point it just starts getting really crazy and you're just like, what the hell happened to this? Well, you know how I think about such things. It's about kids suffering you're supposed to like that. Blah. And it's actually from the same guy who did Boku Rando, which in a way it's supposed to be its improved version. Same shit, different package. But other than that, kids, suffering, blood, because shock factor sells. Blah. 
Onigai Twins, somewhat of a sequel spin-off of Onigai Teacher. Kind of a character-wise responsible fan service show. This whole series deals with taboo relationships. So yeah, last one was the teacher, so you gotta do your twins. I think one of them is actually related to him and one isn't. Raises up the kinky factor to about over the 11. Ooh, are we related? If we aren't related, then which one of us gets to be his uh, girlfriend or something? You know, is this your typical comedy stuff? They pretty much overstep the boundaries anyway. It could have been kind of a moodier, darker show about repressing the urge to push a relationship forward or something and of course this means it is no koikaze in this aspect it's mostly stupid retarded fan service for please teacher fans that doesn't really work that well i'll definitely have decent things to say about please teacher but please twins eh. since this was made before it started getting really popular and like, i started introducing like more of the archetypes i guess it's somewhat better than the stuff we have now if not just because of how less formulaic it is compared to that stuff compared to most things now it's pretty tame if you're looking for fan service but that means that at least it takes it easy on its characters. But it's avoidable. Totally passable if you've already seen enough rom-com. August... Tokyo Godfathers. The most normal of Satoshi Kon's movies. Doesn't really have that many psychological elements. It's a very solid Christmas movie. It's a little too optimistic for what it's going for, but its heart is definitely in the right place. Very empowering, humane, optimistic. It's a very sweet watch, and the action scenes are pretty tense. It's a good movie. September... Full Metal Panic Fumoku, the only decent series Kyoto Animation has ever done. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I actually did enjoy this. I hate on Kyoto Animation so much. They're literally my least favorite studio. What is going on? Is she hammering something? <laughs> <laughs> the squirrel is back. <laughs> okay. This just went up in the pile of product. <laughs> what is she doing? Is she hammering <laughs> Yeah, Kyoto Animation, I friggin' hate them. This is like some sort of miracle that they managed to produce back in the day when they were still not retarded. Read or Die, the TV show. As an action show, the main three heroines are fun, and there is no fan service, so they're decently handled. There is no character development, though. The mystery is more or less stupid, because um, it's about some kind of organization that involves mind manipulation, and it just feels like the plot is there just to support the initial premise. So pretty much the premise is that they fight with, like, paper. It's an interesting series just because of the way they use their weapons, I guess. Their weapons are pages of books. And aside from that, I don't really think it has all that much going for it. You know, there's like a subplot with these secret agents and stuff and how they're going to deal with organizations and whatnot. For this trying to be a follow-up for the OVA, it's a little too much. Personally, I enjoyed the OVA of this more. The animation's better and in general is just more interesting. But yeah, the TV series is not bad. I guess this was a hit with some fans back then, but now it's totally forgotten. I don't even even know this show exists anymore. And this was done by JC staff when they were actually just trying new things, you know. So I guess there's some credit for that. October. Cromarty High School. The manliest show alongside a few others. <laughs> <laughs> but the show is really absurd, just crazy, and you get to see Freddie Mercury riding a horse. This is how you do school comedies. If you're looking for some comedy, this is one of the better ones because it stands out with its style by just the sheer number of absurd stuff. The best school comedy anime that's ever been made. Pretty much the first few episodes are like kind of a guide to how to be a Japanese delinquent. From there it just goes into more absurd situations and just really over the top. Has Waka Motorcycle, has Freddie Mercury, there's a gorilla. Really, what else do you need? And no girls and, yeah, around, man. I'm... Not a single girl around. <laughs> Who needs women, man? It's unnecessary. You have your right hand. <laughs> Plus, it's cool with Gar, man. You cannot find anything else like it. Yeah. Gar. The original Full Metal Alchemist, it is the anime that got me into anime and showed me the potential of how much anime could do, shonen or otherwise. It does not follow the manga, well it does up to a certain point. This anime original ending is a little too philosophical and symbolic for its own good, but it was very mesmerizing for me at the time, so I didn't hate it too much. 
And of course, it is nowhere as good as the new version. But they're both just two separate shows. This one is much more mature overall with its themes and handling than um, Brotherhood ever was. A good thing about this first series is they spend more time uh, in the beginning few episodes uh, developing the two main characters. They kind of gloss over that in the Brotherhood series. So a lot of people recommend that you watch the original series, the first few episodes of those, and then go to Brotherhood. Planetis, everything you wanted from a realistic sci-fi. Easily one of the best hard science fiction stories one can find. Really believable and well-developed setting. It's basically about society in space and how humans realistically survive their, their jobs, their paychecks, their relationships, their hardships, there's career managing, there's ambition. Amazing characters, you get the romance, there's no fan service, it's in space. The main character goes through a wonderful amount of character development, and the ending, even though it has its bittersweet tendencies about it, is one of the most satisfying, most grounded endings you'll ever find in anime, period. It does quite a lot with its premise, very grounded, very responsible. I've never seen a science fiction anime so effortlessly stay on the ground and never take any bullshit cards. This is just one all-around amazing show. There's a couple of bad things about it. The adults are a little too silly, because escapism still is a need that has to be filled out in the show. but. If anything, very, very good stuff. One of the greater animes of all time. Kosetsu Yaku Monogatari. Also known as Requiem from the Darkness. Pretty much it's just another episodic horror anime. I think the problem with this one in particular is that they just try to get fear out of gore, and that doesn't really work. What I did like about it is it has a very experimental art style. It looks very warped and kind of almost like Tim Burton-esque at times. As far as a horror episodic series goes, I'd say this is on high priority. Another one of the better visual novel adaptations is Rumbling Hearts, or Kimi ga Nozomo Ian. It starts off with a nice scenario of a main character having sex with the other girl who recommended the girlfriend to secretly regret it, but then, no, tragedy happens. And then we have a time skip. And even though this is melodramatic, it is melodrama at its finest, because his initial heroine is in a coma. When she wakes up, she has amnesia, flicks with the main character's current relationship of moving on. So he wonders, is it right? for him to date the chick that started this whole thing to begin with, even though it isn't the other girl's fault. It's definitely a very good, grounded, slice-of-life visual novel adaptation. It's still quite basic, even for most standards, but takes itself very, very seriously, and is a very satisfying watch. Gungrave. It starts off really great, like this really dramatic mafia story. It was hilarious to see people yelling in Japanese, BURANDUN HARI! BURANDUN HARI! Harry. <laughs> the character interactions between Brandon and Harry are very much similar to that of Guts and Griffith. But in the second half of the series, they decide, Hey, I'm gonna throw everything in the trash and we're gonna have fucking zombies versus a gay purple cowboy. Anything that was good in the show was turned to pure shit in the second part. I didn't really mind it. Some of the action scenes were pretty decent, so I think I enjoyed this more than Ivan. But at the same time, I do realize that, you know, it could have been a lot better and they didn't have to make into some random action thing. I enjoyed this a lot and there's not many mafia or Yakuza anime that exists, so at least this is one of them. Oh, come on, man, we have Hitman Reborn. It's so close to Mafia. <laughs> Please, no. Gilgamesh. Think of this like a bad combo of Texnolize and Wolf's Reign. Just because they made it to be as bleak as possible doesn't mean it will make up for any boring plot or lack of consistency and all that. It comes down to a battle royale between kids with superpowers and they summon monsters and they transform and use powers and blah blah blah, it's the end of the world coming up. And the end is very Domino-like because they are. that's the only way they can make us think all that actually leads to something, but come on. Very good idea, very boring and uneventful presentation. Gunslinger Girl, Madhouse did this first season, so that's why I think it's better than the second and also it was just a lot more depressing. You know, there's these cute girls and you think it's going to be a very happy anime and a drink tea together. You know, they do drink tea and stuff, but it's just very dark. And I think the big brothers, the guys that are supposed to be like the father figures to the girls, they have like a really big part in shaping their futures and stuff. And some of them, they're supposed to have like this romantic relationship, but it doesn't really work out that way. And 
and it's just definitely more of a fatherly thing going on. So I, I plot it for not going in a really creepy pedophilic relationship thing. Well, it is about lolly assassins, but at least it takes itself seriously. I mean, nowadays we get girls drinking tea or playing with soft guns. Back then it was much more depressing and dark. Of course, other than that, it has the usual shock effect stuff like that I don't like very much. And there wasn't much of a plot. It was just basically getting to know the girls and having these standalone missions where they go to kill or protect somebody. And the second season failed because there was nothing else to do after you have been introduced to all the girls. And yeah, because it wasn't animated by Madhouse but by some minor studio, the whole thing just doesn't look as good. And having a plot just doesn't work with this sort of premise. But at least it's serious and not playing with soft guns. So I guess I'll talk about Shingetsu Tansuki Hime. Doesn't exist. But it does. Honestly, I think it started off and it wasn't all that bad. But the problem is, it's just really boring and you don't really care about any of the characters. I'm sure that visual novel is much, much better and they do a way better job. But, you know, this still exists and it sucks. Yami to Boshi Tohan no Tababito. Shit, that's a long name. Also known as Traveler Yami, Hat and Book. So yeah, it's based on an erotic game and it's about lesbians. One of them is looking for her lover and she goes to all these weird alternative dimensions looking for her. So in a way you should think this like another Reservoir Chronicles, you know, that one by Clamp, where she keeps on going from one alternative reality to another and she has these weird mysteries going on and she finds alternative versions of her lover and yeah, stuff happen. It's an extremely boring series. They could have done so much more with it. You're know, watching this for the sake of of having lesbians and that's supposed to make up for all the boring plots and the non-existing action and the weird mystery nobody really cares about so really good idea but a flop in presentation Blame is actually one of my favorite manga and they made this adaptation and I'm not really sure what they were trying to do with it. It's very experimental, it's very like off the wall and it feels more like small snippets of what was going on without really telling you what the hell is going on. They're just like, yo, you need to figure it out, dude. They're pretty much was made on acid. November. Bo -bo 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 -bo. One of the craziest comedy animes ever made. Of course, yes, because it is so crazy and its entire logic is based on stupidity, people hating the show automatically. But I loved the show for always embracing its stupidity and actually using tactics against villains who kept using logic. This made some of the battles drag on for infinity, but it was watching just how outrageous scenarios could get. It's just one of those shows where creativity, creative stupidity. December. Chrono Crusade is one of the better Gonzo shows. It's kind of melodramatic. It has a premise where you automatically know it can't have a happy ending unless they have an ass pull. So no matter what, they keep having character development knowing that you're going to be pissed off no matter what. I mean, it's a good romance story. It's just too tragic for its own good. And it keeps trying to fluff it out and pat it out with side stories that are too happy. So it, it betrays its own integrity at times. It's like too tongue-in-cheek, you know, and the humor just doesn't work. And none of the characters really stayed with me so it's a very average watch but you know compared to today's standards it, at least it stayed true to its guns so I do have to give credit where it's due. Overall impressions of the year it had Kitnose Journey, it had Textal Eyes, Planetas, Wolf's Rain, Full Metal. This was a good year. I agree this is a very good year. I'd also say it's a very kind of depressing year with stuff like Gunslinger Girl and Textal Eyes. These modern times and everything is very colorful. It's like rainbows everywhere and then like in these shows it's just the color palette's very muted. It's very like, like dull colors and I guess it reflects the time of how people thought back then. Left a lot for more introspection, how the human psyche was and now it's just like really out in the open, very colorful. It's very in your face and I guess some people are into that but I'm not. They don't make anime with this kind of boldness anymore, so it strikes home with one of my um, more favorite nostalgic years. Not many things in winter, we get the usual bunch of titles that have no idea of what to do with our premises, as well as this mysterious thing called Tsukihime. Does it really exist, or is it an urban legend? Whatever the case, it sucks donkey balls and you can bet your ass, this is what UFO table will have to adopt after it's through with Fate Stay Night. Then a bunch of fun service bullshit, with the one standing out being the first season of Iki Tusen. If Elfen Led was the mother of all evil, this one is the mother of all retarded fighting chick anime. And its success is the reason we are now getting five seasons worth of Queen's Blade. 
Full Metal Panic Fumufu belongs to that wonderful era when Kiyoani wasn't only doing Moe shit. It took a run-of-the-mill light novel adaptation and turned it into a hilarious comedy before turning that one into a dark war drama. Sadly, after that, they gave up and went for retarded date sim adaptations while doing nothing with Full Metal Panic other than having cameos in Amagi Brilliant Park. Modern anime suck! If you like occult horror, Requiem from the Darkness is rather successful at being super creepy with a very unusual art style to stand out. And after a forgettable slice of life, we have the top of the season, Captain Herlock. Herlock! Typo aside, it's a cancelled series turned into OVA, so don't expect anything out of it other than good old retro space opera adventures. Summer, on the other hand, is up to the head in titles, both good and bad. The worst one being this anthology of short stories by Rumiko Takahashi. Just like Clamp ran out of ideas and after giving up on having a plot in Inuyasha, she tried to get some extra cash out of this run-of-the-mill short stories, which could easily fit into any of her older comedies. I was not impressed. Then a bunch of run-of-the-mill shonen action bullshit you have no reason to check out until we get to the TV series of Ninja Scroll. And oh my god, is this a complete travesty next to the awesome movie from the 90s. The older, the better. Then a bunch of retarded detective series, none of which matter because only Death Note did it right. Then a bunch of Bones anime which have good production values, amazing premises, room to create masterpieces and they fuck it all up because they don't know what a storyboard looks like. And yes, they have their fans even today, but what do those tasteless casuals know? Shadow Star Narutaro, aka the older and lesser version of Bokurano, and equally exploitive of SHOCK EFFECT to make the audience think that torturing and killing little children means derp. It didn't have the mainstream appeal of Elf and Lead, but you can bet your sweet ass this is the reason overrated bullshit like Madoka Magica are so popular today. Air Master attempts to be a parody of martial arts, and in a way it's the older version of Kenichi. Equally retarded and meaningless, the parody means nothing if there is no point at the end of it. And guess what, there isn't. Stelvio is following the tradition of its director, Satu Tetsuo, taking something that should be an epic space action adventure and turning it into a snoredrome. I mean, if you have asteroids and alien invaders that are about to wipe out humanity, you do it like Space Battleship Yamato did, not like Stelvia. That one felt like a nameless coming of age you would expect in a shoujo manga about a girl trying to be an actress and falling in love and doing all sorts of soppy things. Seriously, why are people paying this guy money to kill all the fun in any anime he touches? Bodacious Space Pirates? Long Rage? And yes, even the TV series of Ninja Scroll. What an asshole! And then we have the first season of Gundam Seed, where everything became gay. And yet this travesty is one of the highest selling titles of all times, because the tasteless casuals found the low production values and the stupid character designs to be a true masterpiece. You cannot be trusted, Dunham fandom! Then a bunch of fun service bullshit I will skip until I show you. Dokoida! Do you know what UFO Table was doing before becoming Type Moon's little bitch? They were creating random comedies about superheroes in diapers. And if that sounds completely unappealing, you're right, it is. Skipping some sports nobody will watch to get to Tokyo Godfathers, a movie which has Satoshi Kon's signature touch of making a social critique of the modern way of life. Only this time he did it in the form of a silly Christmas family movie where everything is funny and miracles happen because Jesus loves you and all that sappy shit. There is no tension, everything plays out so conveniently that you might as well consider this a fairy tale. Social critique, my ass. Remember what I said some time ago about Serei no Moribito? It's a bunch of stuff, none of which stand out. The same thing applies to the Twelve Kingdoms, which may feel like a magical epic adventure but it's closer to how the people of a different world live and act. It's all about getting to know the setting, the characters are fairly dull and forgettable, and thus I consider this one to be slice of life in a magical setting, and very good at that, but it sure as hell didn't excite me and the incomplete ending just leaves you hollow. There is nothing to take away from it other than, oh, what nice ideas about an RPG campaign concerning people we don't care about. And with that said, we are in the top 3 of the season, where we encounter more cheesy retro action in the form of yet more Saint Seiya. Typical fighting shonen, but good for what it is nonetheless. Second place this goes to Technolies, one of the most slow and depressing anime ever created. This show is trying to make you kill yourself, not because it's bad, but because it's very good at being bleak and treating life as something meaningless and joyless, and I'm totally not watching anime for that sort of thing. It's still a very good psychological science fiction drama, of course, but it's very hard to get into it. And first place goes to the first season of Ghost in the Shell. Yes, it wins once again. It's that good, and unlike Technolize, you actually enjoy watching its intriguing science fiction setting where life and humanity lose their meaning. Thumbs up for something based on a retro movie. Most of the completed titles of Spring are typical failures which didn't do something with their premise or didn't have anything to do in general because they are aimless comedies or slice of life. What stands out from them is Kino's Journey, which many love for the social exploration but is otherwise following the same logic as the Twelve Kingdoms. The setting is the only thing that matters, not the characters. Some constantly try to excuse this as the characters are the ones creating those societies, but what is there to care about characters you only see for a couple of episodes, or a protagonist who is simply a passive observer? An overrated title for all I care, but still different enough to worth checking it out. From action titles we have Inter
Peter's Stella 5555, which is essentially an anthology of songs presented as a simple space adventure with retro art style. Did I say retro? Movie of the season! Aside from that, it's also something different enough to worth checking it out. There is also The Animatrix, again an anthology of short side stories based on the movie trilogy of The Matrix. They are not a cash grab since they flesh out the setting and have a different art style in each one of them to keep them distinctive enough from anything else, thus becoming the OVA of the season and again worth checking it out. As for the top title of the season, what else could it be if not Princess Tutu, the real best deconstruction of Magical Girls? Not Madoka Magica, which stole ideas from a dozen titles and turned everything into a plot device. Despite being a kid-friendly show, it still packs a lot of interesting and occasionally dark themes, while having a sad, solid ending, as well as one of the most memorable side characters of all times. I feel for you, Neko Sensei! Winter is far richer in titles and variety, but that also means many more failures, which again have to do with the shows not having any clue of what to do with their premises. From those which stand out here, there is the second season of Big O. The first one was a tribute to make of the 60s with Batman as a pilot and Queen playing music in the background, while retaining a mystery regarding the setting. The second season just lost its way and made a mess out of character development, regressing the characters into more stereotypical roles and had a bizarre ending very few understood or cared about. The second season of Mahoromatic tried to take a typical fetish comedy about maids and turn it into a psychological drama with, again, a very what the fuck ending. It's like the two studios making this were in conflict, with Gainax wanting to create another Evangelion and Shaft wanting to make a prototype for Bakemonogatari. The result was a mess of ideas which failed to do what Kiwani succeeded in doing with Full Metal Panic. Overman King Gainer is essentially the show where Domino lost it completely. He always didn't have a clue on how to depict mood swings, but at least his older titles were about war and tragedy, whereas this one is a mess of mecha action, comedy and mystery. You finish watching it and you have no idea what just happened or why would you care about any of these comic relief characters. And that is the exact same problem with his current g Reco Gundam. There is a complete disjoining amongst character, motivations, plots and tone. Doesn't make any sense and he sure as hell doesn't care to try making any. He could get away with it in the 80s when the early Gundams were still a new concept regarding the chaotic nature of war, but not anymore, now it feels completely retarded. After that, a whole bunch of comedies I have nothing to say other than they don't do much with their premises. Most will claim Hanada Shonen Shi is actually pretty mature for an otherwise kid show about a boy interacting with the dead, but the whole thing is too light to mean anything. It feels like all the effort is wasted for not being darker or deeper about it. Then the meaningless sports where I also include Hikaru no Go. Yes, it's a sport, shut up, they're playing with black and white pebbles, using strategy instead of retarded heart of the cards plot convenience, but it's still very mediocre as far as tension goes, because it's a sport, yet it nothing happens if you lose! That is why by today's standards, gamble titles like Akagi and Kaichi completely overshadow it. Then slice of life where nothing happens, then another mediocre season of Digimon, and then the best deconstruction of Popeye dolls! Unlike all the rest of the bullshit series where underage singing girls are seen as nothing but fop material, this one is a dark tale of death and dealing with the cruel reality of the idol business. Okay, it's also a comedy and a silly shoujo romance, but those don't ruin the tone. They mix very well and add to the creation of an amazing show. As for the annual winners, turns out all of them are found in the spring season. Best TV series is Princess Tutu, although Ghost in a Shell and Full Moon are still great titles on their own. But they didn't have Neko Sensei! And by the way, this show crosses over to 2002, so good luck finding something to top it. Best movie? Interstellar 5555. The other candidate was Tokyo Godfathers, which was a silly Christmas story, whereas this one is a space adventure with retro art style. And best of the OVAs is the Animatrix, because it stands out and fleshes out the setting far more than the typical Sensei and Captain Herlock. The only changes this three years had was adding the big three as notable mentions. Although I am constantly shitting on them for the crap they are so full of, I can't deny that there was a time when they used to be good. I really liked Naruto until the battle at the waterfall, Bleach until Soul Society and One Piece until Arabasta. These parts are recommendable and they deserve a mention. Also, since this time I am giving different scores to a series depending on their arc, the averages increased in these years and surpassed the one in 2006 and 2007 which I considered to be the golden age of anime. Not that they weren't, but the gradual decline of the big three and the sudden increase of butter titles in following years worked against the averages. As for the title I am obligated to overview next from these titles, it has to be one of the big three and the only one I haven't made one for is Bleach. So now you know what follows.